species of plants that are capturing more energy than others because those are the ones that eat first. And the soils are totally covered. The rain can't cap the soil. The sun can't get to the soil. The wind can't get to the soil because I've got different heights of forage left behind. It breaks the wind. I've got carbon on top of the soil holding all the moisture. The environment at soil surface level has changed. What more do you want? In actual fact, I've got another five ranches. Why are you using two strands of wire then? <coughs> Sorry? Why are you using two strands of wire to go out? So? Because a lot of that property used to be cultivated. And it's got contours in it. And when I believed that electric fences were there to keep cattle in, I needed two strands, one earth and one live. You also get pretty dry in our part of the world. But natural fact, if cattle get out, you're expecting them to eat something they don't want to eat. So one strand is plenty. More than. And if they're jumping out, you're pressuring them. And why are you pressuring them? It's like fighting with a bank with Okay. Now what happens with diversity? Look at all those egrets flying around. Now most people call those tick birds. No, they're not tick birds. They're not egret ticks. They walk next to the cattle and they eat their locusts and things that jump up and earthworms and various other things. But as a child we virtually had none of those. And this herd, this particular herd, must have, I don't know, 1,200, 1,500 egrets flying over it. Magic. So the whole diversity in birds, life, insects, cattle, has changed. Even in Paraguay it works. Now that's the closest I can get to describing Paraguay, is that gaucho. who has on his back pocket there in his belt enough implements to eat a, an animal where it dies. <laughs> that's what they do. If they think it dies, they eat it there. <laughs> So what are we talking about? We're talking about changing the bacterial fungal relationship in the soil. This is a Laningham's work. Betsy Ross from Texas has taken it a bit further. She makes a living by spraying compost tea and lee, worm leaf cake and various other things onto pastures, especially with bunny huggers who don't want any cattle messing up their properties. <laughs> As much as they think they're saving the world, they're actually dooming us to extinction quicker than they're saving us. But that's their prerogative. And that's fine. So this is Elaine Ingham's work, and she says if you take bare soil and you nuke it, you've got a hundred percent bacterial life in that soil. And as you move around, you get different bacteria, you get protozoa and a bit of fungi and nematodes, and the fungal bacterial relationship changes to 0.01. So you move on, and then you get into a situation where you will grow weeds, grasses with high nitrates, it will be compacted soil, and at that the fungal bacterial relationship is 0.1. And so you go through to early grasses, Romus, Bermuda, to mid grasses and vegetables at 0.75, and then down to late successional grasses and row crops, 1.1. One, one fungal to bacteria, shrubs, vines, bushes, two to five. And so you go around until you get to what something looks like Yellowstone National Park, where it is totally fungal. And that's why you've got very little grassland left there. And then some idiot drops a match and burns the whole place down. <laughs> and nothing grows for three years because it is absolutely sterilized by the heat of the fire. But what grows? more pine trees. So I believe it's something slightly different and I've adopted and adapted this with the help of Betsy who now sprays to achieve what I do with animals. So Pam will tell you we behave like two children when we get together because we get so excited. Betsy's 84. 
but we get so excited because we are reaffirming with each other what is happening above the soil, which is a reflection of what is below the soil, and we achieving it, she with spraying and me with cattle, and we get terribly excited. So this is what happens. We look at the soil food wet, which is Elaine Ingham's work, and through succession and increasing productivity, we can move this in either direction. Remember Yellowstone National Park went from being mute, and we then presume it will go linear to bacterial? No, it doesn't. It can go either way, but only animals can move it. So there's a slight difference to it. So we can move it in either direction. Now how important is that? Tennessee. One year, high animal impact, carbon in the soil, we achieved that. With half the animal impact, we achieved that. And with no animal impact, we achieved that. Now tell me which one you would rather have. <coughs> Who cares? I prefer that myself. Because there are a whole bunch of new ranches in those forests if you just learn to manage them properly. Now I said to you earlier that the timber grows better. Do you think that timber is not going to grow better than that timber? Common sense, people. Let's not forget it. But Ian, so how did, how did you get that first picture? Sorry? What, did, what happened to get that first picture you showed that? Have fun. Unroll some bales in there during your winter. You can't do something with all these bales you're killing. <laughs> <laughs> it's money, baby. You have fun with it. Roll it out of the ground. But make sure you're having fun. <laughs> now, it works in any environment. Don't come and tell me, oh, but we different. I actually taught in California. You know, they're terrible people. <laughs> and you know why they're terrible people? Because they believe they're different. Because the country is different. They happen to have a Mediterranean climate. And so I spent one and a half days explaining to them that they were no different from anybody else. <laughs> but anyway, this is Botswana. This is the Kalahari Desert. The guy on the left now is... I don't know how clear the slide is for me. But maybe you don't. Know, like on, on this side, on my side, has got some bush. It's got a lot of grass, and the fence lines have to be disked to prevent fires. Okay? On the left-hand side is conventional ranching, set stocking. There is no grass. They've got 100% more trees, and can carry a twelfth of the cattle that the guy on the right is carrying. Per hectare. Choose where you want to go. That's the guy on the right. This is the area that is dist. The dist area on the guy who's practicing holistic management is better than the other guy's normal pasture. More food up. Come here. Tomatoes, as we call it in our part of the world. This guy uses no herbicide, no fungicide, no insecticide. No fertilizer. Look at his tomatoes. He produces 48% of the tomatoes in Southern Africa. He balances the bacterial fungal relationship to get it right for tomatoes to grow without getting diseases. They got the pH right. And that's what happens. So then he puts compost tea and worm leakate down his drip irrigation. And those are the tomatoes he grows. He only picks first grade tomatoes. Because that's all he grows. So it can be done. Laningham's work, seasonal microbial activity. <coughs> Don't need to talk to that. Originally, I believed that you only had to have high stock density in the winter. You need to do it in the grain season, when the microbes and the 
fungi are alive and working. And it goes back to my slide where you can move it in either direction depending what you want it. So those guys who produce 48% of the tomatoes in Southern Africa, they're now growing avocado pear trees as well. But it's a different fungal bacterial relationship. And so they just make sure that before they even plant the tree, that that relationship is right. I'm not going into each one of these because we might talk for a day on each. <laughs> So, so like hogs or, or swine, if you're doing a multi-species and they're disturbing the soil, is that pushing me backwards on my primary operation of cattle? Pushing you to bacterial, where with recovery you'll grow grasses and not trees. So yeah, you, you manage it for where you want to be. And if you want to go further, then you, you get grasses first and then if you want legumes, you need a slightly longer recovery period and high stock density for a shorter period of time. And then you can manage it for a 50-50 clover grass pasture. Whatever you want, you can manage it for. And you're actually managing the bacterial to fungal relationship. Okay. All the stuff we've spoken about. <coughs> Life in the soil, landing him, brilliant. Guys, this is all available on the internet, in the books, whatever. And the beauty of the internet today it is linking those of us who've done different things and enable us to communicate without physically having to visit. But it's not quite the same as the physically meeting and talking. So again, litter on the ground, covered soils, increasing production, balanced ration for animals, preferably no inputs, and an improved triple bottom line. Socially sound, environmentally sound, and financially sound. That is a legume that is grown at home. It looks like a cowpea. As a child, I'd never seen it. It's now all over the property because I've got my recovery period correct. And I stopped burning using the tool of fire. So what happens in a cow? Very few of us know. Pretty straightforward with the livers and everything. And this is actually drawn by somebody at the University or College of Virginia, I can't remember his name, but he didn't give me permission to use it. So we look at the rumen ecosystem process and it's the stomach and food goes into the stomach, the true protein goes in and it's broken down by the bacteria and into digestible uh, fiber etc and then goes into the intestine where a lot of it is absorbed. And then we've got some bypass protein which can go straight to the intestine and then we get the blood flow. So that excess ammonia that comes in from excess protein at this time of the year breaks down to ammonia. The ammonia goes to the edge of the stomach. First of all it creates frothy bloat and you'll kill your animal with bloat. So bloat is too much protein particularly if it is drought-prone clovers or frosted clovers, you'll get a lot of condensed protein in that and you'll pick up a problem. So if you're putting cattle into a lot of clover, try and put them in at midday. At home there were some dairy farmers that were in a group and the laziest dairy farmer had the best figures. And the consultant who had done holistic management was irritated. And eventually he decided to go and sit on a hill and watch each one of them as to what happened that day. The best farmer was out early in the morning, everything was done and dusted, and his cattle were in the pastures by 8 o'clock. The worst farmer, 
This candle never got to the pastures until 11 o'clock. Just that extra energy from 8 to 11 increased his milk supply. So, you get the ammonia coming off, excess protein, it hooks up with the hemoglobin in the blood supply, it creates blood, uh, methemoglobin, the carbon dioxide can't get out of the body, can't release in the lungs and take on oxygen because the affinity with hemoglobin and ammonia is very strong and the animal starts panting. The ammonia goes through, it clogs up the liver, the liver gets clogged, it goes to the kidneys, the kidneys get clogged, all the organs close down. And before you're realizing this animal's losing weight, it won't conceive, the first thing that closes down is the reproductive organs. The average conception rate in South Africa is 62%. Those are all the various things. So the blood then goes to the lungs, it can't get rid of this ammonia can't bring in oxygen and we have animals standing in the water because there's no shade no 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 they are hot they got they can't get oxygen that's why they pant and they stand in the water because to them panting is associated with heat and it's the black cattle people <laughs> but that's a human invention <laughs> Be careful of smell also in the water. You get the anaerobic microbes being washed, uh, stirred up from the bottom of the tank and it smells. And the cattle won't drink it. Then they won't drink the water so they go to the pasture which has more water in it than the good water in the pond. So then they overeat and they overeat more protein. Oh my goodness, this starts getting exciting. <laughs> anyway, believe it what you like. What does it do to the uptake of minerals? Now there are just some of the minerals. We've got nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, calcium, magnesium, iron, manganese, boron, copper, zinc. I can't even read anymore. But anyway, <laughs> that just shows you at pH of 7, everything is taken up in the required amounts. If the pH fluctuates up or down, you're not taking in the right amount or absorbing the right amount. The animal will get the message from the stomach, source some more, if the pH is wrong, because it is going straight out the back end. And people, it's expensive. And if it's going out the back end, so your mineral feeding is done on a financial basis, how much can I afford to give my animals? And when they've taken it, stop before you go broke. Because you will go broke, because you don't know how to manipulate the pH to start with. So learn how to manipulate the pH and then feed the minerals and then you might have some joy. That's what it looks like. 18 compartments with a piece of conveyor belt on the top. So let's tie everything up and go back to looking at the hole. This is just the beginning. Put your, put your toe in the water to get started. Do you have 18 different minerals in each of those? 18, yeah. Okay. Can you tell us what the minerals are? Sorry? Can you tell us what the minerals are? The minerals are? Um, just all of the things that are listed in the Go to the science book. 
And look up all the minerals and that's what they are. <laughs> <laughs> Including an acidity, acid balance and an alkaline balance. Back, back to the stockpile. You, you showed, let's say we have 12 inches of stockpile. You would let the cattle in and let them eat the top three inches and leave nine, planning to come back a month later to take from nine to six so that hopefully you still have six or three before the grass starts growing so when they come in in May now, or now in May, they're getting that new growth but they still have that three inches of fiber, which, okay. Absolutely. Exactly opposite of what. So, in doing that, you protected everything that you can from the cold, and you'll find that after the second year of doing that, that your green grasses are starting to grow under that six weeks before your neighbor. And six weeks is a long time in terms of money. That guy who does bison in South Dakota does stockers as well. And he said, I've increased his grazing period in South Dakota by two months. And he's been gaining five kg, sorry, five pounds a day. On his autumn grass, five pounds a day times the price you get in America, times whatever. It's a bunch of money. But the natural, the cool season grasses and the warm season grasses are there. We just got to set the conditions for them to grow. And you will have a mixture of warm and, and cool. Right. Now, California says, you know, we don't have warm season grasses yet. We don't have perennials. I said, oh. No, no, even the old timers can't remember a perennial grass. And I said, well, I didn't realize California was that messed up. <laughs> <laughs> and the lady started to do it two years before I got there. By the time I got there, I mean, the excitement was unbelievable because they had all the one season grasses and the perennials. And there's no difference. Everybody says cool season is different from warm season. No, it's only the colleges that have told us it's different. It is the same principle. The colleges have got to have something to teach you, so <laughs> to make it more, more and more from less. Same thing. When you provide the mineral free choice, are you putting like a pure form in each box, like pure sulfur in one, or how do you do that? If I you, I contact Free Choice Enterprises, Wisconsin, Mark Bader. He mixes them all into the right proportions. He's a biochemist, by the way. He's not a nutritionist. And he will make sure that the right amount gets into the animal without the animal overeating. For instance, uh, selenium yeah. is very toxic. Now, if the animal overeats with selenium, it could die. And he, the way he does it, it won't, won't die. What was his name again? Mark Bader. B-A-Y-L-O-R? B-A-D-E-R. Beta Meinhof. Huh? The same beta. They sell the box that you put the minerals into. Free Choice Enterprises, Wisconsin. The relation to the quality or flavor of the finished beef with regard to what you're doing is huge. Hints about that. What, what grades that? that if is, you yeah. slaughter an animal, and the pH is 8 or 9, it will taste like urea. It is tough. And that is why people in America are having a problem with grass fed. If you slaughter an animal with the incorrect pH, that animal will get salmonella. It will get, what were you talking about, Joe, at lunchtime? E. coli. E. But if you sort it at the right, at the right, it's in. It'll be sweet. And it won't get those salmonella and E. coli. Is that right? So the preparation of the, you know, some folks grass fed at a higher temperature, it makes it tough. It's good. It's really not happen here. It's more yeah. intensive by the pH. Mm -hmm. We slaughter fat cows, we don't slaughter young stock. Mm -hmm. 
and preferably the car needs to be 10 years or older. We slaughter it, we put it in, we shoot it so it doesn't know it's being slaughtered. There's no adrenaline. We leave it under a top wall. This I learned from South America. And then you hang it up in a tree, take the skin off, take the stomach out, leave it for 24 hours at room temperature. And then put it in the cool room at 4 degrees centigrade. 10 days. And I don't care how old that animal is, you eat any part of it with a fork. As you Americans do, anyway. <laughs> Our son shot a kudu, had virtually no teeth. By the time it got to the house, it was at room temperature. We took the hide off, the stomach out, and the tank for 10 days. Beautiful. Any more questions? Oh, yes, sir. Wait, I'm sorry. Did you hang it at room temperature? No, 4 degrees. On room, 4 degrees, but room temperature for uh, 24 hours to get to room temperature. <coughs> Half of the taking the animal where they're still warm into a cold room shortens the muscles and it gets tough and then we've got to shock it because we like to send them an eight at time and give it to <laughs> We like to be moved further away from our source. And we're paying for all those people <coughs> to do the jobs for us to make it an edible product, whereas if we were left alone, we'd supply the edible product. So, you addressed this a little bit earlier um, about leaching. The question was arised about leaching of the rain and the, as the pasture sits all winter. Address that, how you see that happening um, as far as the stalk standing, the whole length of grass. I get all that. I'm with that. As the rain comes all winter or snow or what have you, the leaching of the minerals and the nutrients out of the plant by spring. Just speak to that for a second. So what happens with the standing forage, it withers rather than leaches. Uh -huh. Okay. So it's the hot cold, hot cold phenomena that creates more of a problem. Mm -hmm. The leaching of product of minerals out of the soil doesn't take place as seriously as if you had no carbon because the carbon keeps the temperature at a bit of uh, differential which locks it in, keeps the minerals there. Mm -hmm. At varying temperatures, that product is leached out a lot easier. Right. Right. So if you have big, tall, standing, 12, to, and you have temperature that's above freezing, below freezing, above freezing, below freezing, you can have some leaching. Sure. Well, okay. Sure. Great. Thank you. Could you talk a little bit about transitioning? So you've learned over your time, you started out this way, you transitioned out of your southern So what happens is, you do it for the average to be back in 30 days. But we know we move faster with fast growth. So when the temperatures are high and the moisture is plentiful, we move faster. So we shorten the recovery period. Right? So here we bring that to, we correct this to 25. And we might say in slow growth we move slower. So we make that to 35. Now I'm just taking two figures. Nothing has to be absolute. This thing about working out every last square decimal point is a load of rubbish. <laughs> Don't do it.